who has made significant contributions in the area of NDE and SHN, which is very close to the structural integrity the, uh, uh, of the systems. So I have a very brief biodata of him. I'll try to introduce him. Dr. Shamsundar is currently a chief advisor of Azirity Private Limited, Chennai, and a mentor of Terra Lumen Solutions, Chennai. Uh, and he is also the vice president of the Indian Society for Non-Destructive Testing, ASNT. And he was actually looking after the, the certification and courses that the ASNT conducted, and he did a wonderful job on this. He is also a former principal scientist and quality innovation leader at G. Uh, he worked there from 2000 to 2020 and a former scientific officer at IG Kalpakam from 1984 to 2000. He holds a B metallurgy degree from MS University of Baroda and PhD from IIT Kharagpur. And he has over 37 years of experience as innovators, researcher, technologists, and trainer with a deep domain expertise in multidisciplinary area of NDE of materials, components, and structures as applied to uh, nuclear, aerospace, oil and gas, power, renewables, transportation, and other industries. Uh, he loves exploring new domains and advanced technologies and has worked in some of the most uh, uh, advanced techniques in electromagnetics, ultrasound, radiography, NDE, automation, robotics, drones, for industrial inspection for challenging applications in industry. He is currently pioneering the adoption of NDE 4.0 and inspection through digital transformation, uh, uh, such as IoT, digital twins, AR and VR uh, uh, techniques, analytics, and using AI and ML techniques. He is passionate about industry academia interaction and working towards enabling the same. Uh, he has uh, 12 patents and 160, over 160 papers in various journals, books and proceedings and has delivered over 90 invited talks. Received several prestigious awards like National NDT Award for R&D, GE, India's JRD Tata, Award of Excellence, G. Whitney Award, to name a few. He is a honorary fellow of ISNT and a life member of ASNT, MSI, AMSI, INSIS. He is in the editorial board of the Journal of NDE, actually published by ASNT, the quarterly journal. And he is a reviewer of several experimental techniques. So today we have a really a very distinguished speaker who have made significant contribution and if you want to say somebody who has done some work and you want to know something about ND in this country, Sham is one of the person. So welcome, Sham, and you can start your presentation. OK, thank you very much. Uh, my slides are visible. Yeah. OK, great. Thank you, Dr. Gopal, for the introduction. Uh, thank you to the Indian Structural Integrity Society, Dr. Raghu Prakash, for having invited me to uh, talk on this topic. And of course, uh, delighted to see several familiar uh, you know, friends and uh, names on the screen attending the talk. So a uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, so as was mentioned, so we'll talk a, a little about NDE and SHM for structural integrity. Uh, my entire career, as you just heard, was on NDE primarily, dabbled a little bit here and there on SHM. So again, uh, you will see a bias on NDE rather than SHM during the talk. Uh, but nevertheless, they are very, very closely interlinked. Uh, uh, there was a, uh, about a decade ago, I recollect there was lots of discussion and uh, there were seriously uh, people contemplating the fact that, uh, you know, SHM uh, will be the way to go for future and NDE will slowly be kind of, you know, uh, uh, taken out of the scenario. And uh, which which was kind of natural, given the fact that, you know, you really wanted to know the state of the component or the structure uh, on a more continuous basis rather than intermittently as it happens in NDE and inspection. But nevertheless, I think uh, what we have also seen is that adoption of SHM is a little bit of a challenge still. 
and uh, will be slow uh, uh, irrespective of however ad how much advances we make and so nevertheless uh, i think both will coexist for probably you know several decades to come that's my kind of uh, general reading a uh, quick round of acknowledgments as i as you heard i worked at different places so all my colleagues and team members whatever i have done in the last 37 years is the is a culmination of so much uh, collaboration teamwork uh, with colleagues none of it is exclusively my own so obviously uh, uh, a word of acknowledgement to all of them all my teachers advisors at the various places i studied at ms university iit and iit kharagpur so if you look at the industry spectrum extremely wide as you very well know uh, you know and hence the challenges also are equally wide uh, to lots of different types of industry lots of different components and structures the materials which get used and uh, you know the damage mechanisms which eventually lead to the primary uh, you know issue of structural integrity and that itself is a magnanimous challenge uh, for the inspection industry for the material industry to overcome and so it, it it it's a it's a evolution it's a development which is constantly happening every day every hour uh, in terms of technology development but still there is so much more to do and what we have still accomplished or been able to accomplish so far in in, in spite of the extremely uh, you know large number of research happening in academia in r and d institutes and industry is still probably a tip of the iceberg to get to the holy holy grail of uh, you know structural integrity so terminologies which uh, <clears throat> uh, we will talk about and again this audience probably does not need but just in case there is anybody who is kind of uh, new to the topic so obviously we, we know its the ability of the structure to withstand its intended loading without failing due to fracture deformation fatigue or any other damage mechanism uh, and uh, it is uh, to ensure that the design uh, life of any component or structure is fulfilled uh, without any potential failure before that and and to do that the biggest thing which comes into mind is ensuring quality quality at every stage from the raw material to the product to the assembly and while in service and it's just not quality of the product we all by now realize that you cannot make a defect free product and hence uh, you do your best to uh, insert quality in the product stage but there is an equal amount of quality required after it is put in service uh, in in terms of its maintenance in terms of its uh, operations in terms of its uh, regular inspection uh, a, a lack of quality even in those stages can lead to a structural integrity kind of uh, related failure much ahead of its intended uh, design life uh, definition of ndt not again very uh, uh, not only for those who probably have not been uh, exposed to it you know basically use of non invasive techniques to determine the integrity of the material component or structure uh, and of course measure characteristics of the object and why non destructive we all know you know we, we can't afford to lose the end product and so the more we do it in a non destructive manner we continue to use the component and the structure uh, without essentially harming its end use and then of course you know uh, uh, the, uh, the there are so many techniques which are available and wide variety of sensors uh, you know in most cases it's an active system where we excite it by imparting some energy probably except infrared imaging and a few others like acoustic emission uh, where it is more of a passive uh, thing uh, it is time consuming no doubt you know uh, when you're talking about large areas large volumes to be inspected cannot be done very fast and uh, you know uh, you know the, the uh, various complications which come in terms of the materials the thicknesses and of course the fact that you know we uh, in, there are many components which cannot be inspected while in service and you have to shut it down leading to loss of productivity and so on so and and in a most simplistic term this is the process you excite you know uh, the material with any kind of a energy and then there is an interaction which happens there is a response to the interaction which is what we measure uh, be it thermal mechanical magnetic electric and so on and then uh, that evaluation of the response is eventually what gives you the information on the defects and properties so uh, nde is called a cradle to grave technology because it starts right at the raw material stage 
when it comes out of the the ore comes out of the mine and when you start processing it we use uh, nde uh, when it is processed into material or metal it is used uh, nde is formed and then when it is processed then you manufacture the component you put these components to get together to make a structure and assemble them uh, and then in service when the installed component or structure is actively uh, working for, to do its intended purpose and then the end of life. So the, I, I aptly called cradle to grave because it starts and goes on till the end of life. And here the subtle difference between the NDE inspections versus SHM where uh, inspections are obviously performed at predefined intervals and uh, we you know without consideration of previous evaluations which has which is changing it's not necessarily the same right now we do now have legacy and historical data which we pay a lot of attention to uh, in now and as we as we go forward we'll see when we talk about things like digital twins uh, the legacy inspection data becomes very important to design the digital twin and uh, you know make it forward but uh, traditionally this is how it used to happen and obviously you would get uh, you know you really did not have a way of knowing uh, what exactly was happening between inspection one and inspection two. And if a failure happened between the intervals uh, leading to forced outage of the structure or the plant uh, was obvious, obviously something which we did not want uh, in our, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in any uh, plant or industry. Uh, NDE is widely used for many, many things, just not just for flaw detection. And uh, that uh, has increased tremendously over the last two decades, right from stresses to microstructure to damage. And of course, you know, uh, you know uh, getting down to even even uh, uh, micro level uh, defects. Um, SHM for again, you know, uh, a well known definition is obviously the continuous in service monitoring of the physical condition of any structure uh, using embedded or attached sensors with minimum intervention. And uh, the big difference being it's continuously monitors or you could choose to monitor at intervals which are much shorter than what you saw in the previous uh, thing, uh, but you have the access. In the case of a normal NDE inspection, uh, you essentially had to shut down probably the structure uh, or the uh, uh, component to do get to the inspection. Here, given that you are already installing the sensor on the structure to be inspected, you really don't have to worry about that. Uh, you could uh, you know, increase the frequency of inspection to uh, extremely short intervals or even make it absolutely continuous. And of course, it uses a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, that's where it gives us the prognostics, which are very necessary to really decide on the uh, when when to take uh, the uh, you know, uh, component or structure for maintenance, for repair, for replacement. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, basically uh, the unscheduled maintenance, which is always a big challenge for all, be it aircrafts, be it a refinery, be it a power plant, uh, that is the biggest pain point for all of them. That is kind of removed uh, from the equation when you do SHM, and it certainly brings a big benefit. And so this certainly gives the designers a big, big uh, design benefit <clears throat> because SHM can give you uh, you know both the maintenance benefit and the design benefit by you know uh, moving the curves as you can see towards the right where you can uh, uh, continue to load the component uh, because you are able to monitor it uh, similarly that can also automatically help increase the maintenance interval also so clearly the design benefits and the maintenance benefits which can uh, act, uh, which can be acquired because of shm is very very interesting uh, SHM, of course, uh, uh, you know, you, you have various ways of doing it. Lots of sensors. We are not going to be talking uh, of too many things. As I said, you know, uh, going to be more focused on NDE. But again, you know, you can see that, you know, uh, lots of developments have happened in the uh, sensors area, uh, which can now become, you know, uh, very, very small, very, very thin, you know, can be pasted on the surfaces, can be embedded into surfaces surfaces and give you all the required details which you would want uh, you know to monitor the structure <clears throat> and then of course uh, you know uh, it can be extended to many things including you know corrosion fatigue cracks name it name the damage mechanism you would really like to monitor and uh, uh, there is there is a high possibility that today we have some mechanism or some sensor which can do it yes the resolution the accuracy and the reliability still certainly remains something which is 
uh, yet to you know uh, surpass the required uh, levels of uh, you know uh, uh, what 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 industries would like but i think we, we were slowly getting there uh, the the other fact of course with shm has been the traditional uh, debate about yes you know um, some of the most useful uh, structures are in industries which are very critical and uh, when when we talk about critical industries with critical infrastructure uh, the challenge of getting uh, the uh, approvals to put the sensor on board and or to embed them obviously also becomes challenging because of its other inherent issues but i think uh, the world is slowly moving towards overcoming them with the extensive amount of research which is happening on this around the world again like I just said there are plenty of uh, sensing technologies, you know, eddy current sensors, Acosto, ultrasonics, FBGs, CVMs, and many, many more, which are all already out there with different levels of capability. So the choice of the right SHM sensor will be based on what you are inspecting, what is the material, what is the uh, size, that is, you know, uh, length or width or volume, and what is it that you are looking for in terms of the sensitivity? Because I think one of the biggest, uh, while the physics of each one of them is very different, which automatically also means the sensitivity of each one of these techniques is going to be very, very different. And of course, that is what we talked about monitoring, which you know continuously tracks the integrity of a component uh, by continuous you know, evaluation. And you could really get uh, loads and tons of information which needs to be continuously processed to get meaningful inf uh, uh, information for making decisions. And so while the amount of data which was traditionally available even earlier uh, using SHM was tremendous. Uh, I think the the biggest challenge was uh, have we made effective use of that uh, you know data to convert it into useful information. And today the world is of course exploding with all the data science kind of approaches, and uh, I'm sure that you will we'll see more and more of that happening. And these are of course uh, if we don't take care of structural integrity, this is what will happen not a pretty set of pictures we any of us would like to encounter in our lifetime but the reality is it happens so structural integrity um, you know failures are a reality and so we have to deal with it uh, one step at a time combining all the technologies available either as an nde technique or an shm technique and so take any industry you can see a sampling of industries here from chemical to aerospace to you know uh, renewables to uh, transportation including the amusement right at the bottom uh, most uh, row the second picture from the uh, uh, left which is uh, shows an amusement right which collapsed because of the uh, insufficient wire rope inspection uh, and leading to the snapping of the wire rope and the whole thing tumbling down so so this is reality like it or not uh, and that's where we all collectively be it uh, you know, uh, the community in INSYS, which focuses on structural integrity, or the community in ISNT, which focuses on NDE techniques, uh, need to come together to solve this massive problem of preventing failures. And so the philosophy of NDE is very uh, straightforward in terms of trying to uh, really you know, um, hit all these three corners of the triangle, uh, you know, which is discontinuities, flaws, and defects. And in all these cases, it's about detection and characterization. Uh, there was a time when uh, we just satisfied with detection, but realized very soon that that doesn't help. It only tells you it's a go no go kind of thing. I don't know what to do with the uh, component if I just find a crack. I want to characterize the crack, understand the crack in much more great detail so that I can put it in the various uh, life assessment models and stuff like that to make a decision on whether there is remaining life available or you know i need to retire this part etc so characterization became an extremely important part over again the last uh, two decades and that is where what pushed the envelope of nde to look at just not detection but characterization also which means uh, flaw characteristics and of course the other two uh, ends of the triangle the damage on the microstructure and the stresses so eventually it is the combination uh, the 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 holy grail, if you would like to call, would be when NDE and SHM uh, will together be able to do all three of this, uh, uh, and that's when probably we will have the most accurate 
predictions uh, available. Uh, today, we, we, it's not that we are not able to do that today, but obviously, uh, you know, the uh, the technology as far as detection of flaws and cracks and defects are concerned is pretty pretty advanced, I should say. Uh, but we can't just say say the same about damage or microstructure or stresses using ND, and that's where I think uh, there are miles there is miles to go before uh, we can claim that uh, NDE and SHM or either of them uh, are really in a position to do all this. Uh, things which we look for. So again, you know, a uh, uh, couple of slides which I'm just going to you know, kind of uh, skim through just in the interest of time. Uh, you know, obviously for quality control during manufacture, ND gets used uh, significantly. And of course, uh, more importantly, uh, the greater challenges lie in the asset integrity or structural integrity in service uh, because of limitations of access, because of, uh, you know, uh, more challenging situations. Um, you know, uh, our limited time available and so on and so forth, uh, which is entirely a different scenario as compared to the factory manufacturing flow. Mm -hmm. The other thing, of course, all the advances uh, in ND also tend to happen uh, on, a, on a regular basis just because of the uh, huge amount of uh, uh, developments uh, which are happening in the adjacencies. Uh, and not really adjacencies, in, in fact, they are the core, it's the materials. Uh, and the design, of course. So, you know, the number of different materials we have seen come out there as uh, the demand on the uh, structure increases, just like the aircraft engine, for example, you know, uh, the carbon fiber composite blade, uh, which was developed by GE for the GE 90 engine. Yeah, something very, very unique. And, uh, you know, it reduced the blade count from 22 to 18, reduced the weight, improved fuel efficiency, and so on. Similarly, the titanium aluminum blades. Uh, you know, reduce the engine weight by about 400 pounds. Uh, you know, uh, again in the in the engine. So all these, I mean, just just this are just a sampling of the developments. And as these things happen, uh, they put a challenge on the inspection and the ND engineers to develop the technology. Uh, you know, to because this was a carbon carbon composite uh, with a you know titanium edge, and so it was pretty challenging to develop the inspection technology for that. Uh, and so on. And similarly, when you go down to another structure like the wind blade, the lengths of the length of the wind blades are constantly increasing. And uh, you know, this is uh, one of the largest one which was manufactured by G uh, for the Halliard uh, 12 megawatt uh, offshore wind turbine, 107 meters long. And one can imagine uh, the challenge both in the material stage, the manufacturing stage, and the inspection stage. And the still bigger challenge once this blade was installed. At an offshore location, and you know, God forbid something went wrong, and you wanted to do the inspection at an offshore location in the middle of the sea. A very, very tough situation. So all these constant developments, while they are, uh, you know, um, a delight for all of us because it's giving us better efficiency, uh, the challenges which come with it also need to be addressed, and that's where, uh, you know, NDE uh, has a very big role to play and is trying its best to keep up with uh, the other developments. The materials for aerospace, again, you know, you know, the increasing use of carbon ceramic matrix composites, uh, you know, as compared to the many of the others in, in various things, you know, be, you know, especially in the engines and, uh, you know, uh, different depending on the component type and so on, uh, you know, be, be it a silicon six sick or ox ox kind of uh, carbon, uh, sorry, ceramic matrix composites. Uh, has fantastic properties, but uh, we still are struggling with the inspection methodologies uh, to do this so that we can assure, uh, you know, its life uh, once it is put in the uh, aircraft engine uh, components. The other challenge which comes along with materials uh, is the different manufacturing processes. And uh, again, this audience needs no introduction uh, to the whole new world of additive manufacturing which again has posed its own set of challenges to the ND, ND uh, researchers and the inspection world mm, because it's an entirely new uh, way of uh, uh, manufacturing things. And uh, while it, it probably makes manufacturing easy, it makes uh, inspection quite a bit of a challenge uh, because of, uh, you know, we are not doing it in single components, but you're in fact building the entire structure together. And so huge amount of challenge of how to use NDE right from the powder characterization stage to in process to final inspection. And uh, as of now, in fact, in spite of all the 
several research going on, you know, CT computer tomography seems to be the only best uh, method which is giving you a lot of answers. People are working on electromagnetics, ultrasound, infrared, all the methods, but still I think uh, lots of lots of challenges. And so uh, that research will continue as this, but clearly uh, a, a, a brilliant uh, manufacturing methodology and uh, we obviously have to make best use of it and it will be for the ND and inspection researchers uh, and uh, you know um, practitioners to come up with the solutions. And again, you know the, the needs continue because of the various types of defects and uh, you know the constant requirement of additional information uh, to make better decisions. Uh, you know again not uh, very very uh, basic things like castings and weldings, uh, large different number of types of uh, defects. So these are conventional which we have all seen and heard and uh, uh, understood over last several decades uh, and hopefully we have uh, the ND techniques have kind of mastered to a large extent how these specific kinds of defects uh, can be detected characterized which uh, technique is the best but the challenge continues to uh, grow every day as complexity in the design complexity in the shapes sometimes make it difficult to inspect and of course, on one hand, we have the defects during manufacturing, manufacturing uh, which arises, but the biggest challenge still continues to be the in-service damage mechanisms, which evolve slowly over time and, uh, and then eventually lead to failure. And that's where I think the largest challenges uh, for the ND engineers still uh, arise because of restrictions, constraints of access to the components which need to be inspected. And of course, you know, because uh, the operating conditions have been different. We have virtually no clue of where we are on this curve, you know, uh, and uh, we really need to understand a lot. And that's where what we talked about, you know, it's a combination of detecting the stresses, the microstructure and the defects, which kind of give us the complete information. So again, you know, just the same thing portrayed in slightly different ways, be it for composites, uh, you know, we, we go, go from you know, a nano level to a macro level. And in all the case, in all the things, the biggest pro issue is that NDT in some ways is an indirect method, except some methods like X-ray, where all you get is an indication uh, of a flaw, and uh, you are left to interpret the signals uh, to make a decision on what the flaw is. And there, the operator variability comes in, and that's where where we were talking about certification in NDT plays a very big role. Uh, you know, it's a very very hands-on technology. And uh, you know uh, uh, it, it requires years of experience on the field with different components, uh, different materials, and different methods to really understand and make decisions uh, based on just a signal which appears on a screen. Today, the world is moving towards uh, AI and ML and many techniques, which is aiding the operator significantly to uh, you know, uh, make decisions easy. But still, we are quite a way uh, way behind. And so, the purpose of ND again, just uh, for a a quick recap is cradle to grave, of course, as we've mentioned, quality control, failure prevention, life prediction, helps availability of the plants, uh, productivity in the plant, and reliability, and of course, the biggest thing, safety. Uh, just taking a quick few examples, weld as a, a one of the biggest uh, issues when we talk about structural integrity, and so many different failures which have happened, and uh, in, invariably, the weakest point was the weld. So, so much attention has been paid uh, over the last uh, several decades to do all kinds of development just to master the weld inspection. And of course, uh, it's historical, right? You know, uh, for, for several decades we have seen that. And the, 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 the challenge with weld defects is, is very, very difficult to understand you know, uh, where it originated from, you know, apart from, of course, we know the broad leaf zone, but so many steps uh, which could lead to a potential defect uh, in the weld, right? Right from a very simple thing as not doing a post weld heat treatment uh, to an improper you know, weld procedure, to an improper electrode which was used, uh, you know, uh, and or, you know, not giving sufficient uh, uh, preheat or you know, the list can go on and on, you know, uh, wrong electrodes and so on and so forth. And of course, yeah, you know, again, a sad picture of a uh, weld failure in a weld uh, in a, a wind turbine tower causing it to uh, collapse so weld failures again everywhere around us 
statistics again, you know, uh, the biggest thing for rail failures again is uh, broken rails and welds, which causes the failure. So uh, failures could happen because of human factors, design flaws, material failures, extreme condition or environments, and of course, the combination of all of them. And of course, the weld discontinuity again, you know, just a, a little more detail of the various types of things which happen. And the, the, the reason to show this was just imagine the various types of defects occurring in one single uh, in, uh, weld. Look at the sizes, look at the orientations, look at the shape, look at their location. Everything is different. And that's where uh, the challenge uh, and, and the advancements which happen in NDE because you know today to detect every uh, defect which you can see on this particular uh, um, uh, picture here probably requires um, uh, two or three different techniques there is no probably no single technique which can do all of it and that's where it becomes challenging because uh, when we talk about using more than one technique uh, the biggest issue is time the biggest issue is personnel because uh, you know a guy who is doing uh, penetrant testing or a magnetic particle testing uh, will not be allowed to do ultrasonic testing or radiographic testing. So you are looking at multiple inspectors, multiple methods uh, to get to an answer. And that's where that uh, the advances happening is to see how can we advance one or at best two techniques to kind of cover everything. And that's again, you know, uh, not not easy to do. Again, just a long list of discontinuities to deal with in the weld. And you know, uh, many of them are internal and many of them are external, which is where we talked about surface ND methods and volumetric ND methods, both, both being uh, required for inspection. And this is a typical uh, what you would look in a refinery and, and the welds are there all over this place and very, very uh, challenging situations to do any inspection of welds in this installed condition. You can imagine this. You know what a what a mess it is here to climb up somewhere and do do inspections and the number of welds which need to be inspected and, and so on and so forth. So so a lot of lot of advancements uh, to to see how we can handle. Uh, here is an example of how uh, the whole world of X radiography, which we used to do with films, uh, is now entirely moving to a digital world. So uh, you know fully digital radiography, just like we do for digital photography and including you know we can do put it on scanners you can see on the top right hand picture the x-ray source and the scanner uh, and the sorry the detector are on opposite sides of a scanner the scanner crawls over the pipe near the weld and does a complete weld inspection so um, you can do it from the you know if it's in the manufacturing plant you can even do it from the id of the uh, you know uh, pipe or uh, tube or whatever you're looking for so so digital radiography uh, which is really a very very powerful tool which is getting used uh, for weld inspections uh, and for general inspections also and of course when that is combined with all the advancements which is taking place in the domain of uh, adr what we call as automatic or assisted uh, detection uh, you know adr automated uh, you know detection uh, that again is becoming very powerful uh, uh, reducing the strain on the operator so here you can see how one of the adr algorithm based on ai is able to automatically pick up the defects and so on so it's a huge advancement on that so when we talk about x radiography the bigger other challenges what we have is what is called as the cordon of distance because wherever an x radiography shot is happening for a weld um, or even any other you know structure in a plant uh, there is a cordon of rays which you can see there it's almost equal to a football field in the top right hand side uh, left hand side you can see and uh, that prevents uh, radiography being done during all the uh, shifts in a day you know, typically during uh, shutdown maintenance, uh, their plants would like to work three shifts a day. Uh, but radiography, you cannot have any personnel uh, standing anywhere uh, within that cordon of distance. That makes it impossible because there are um, thousands of workers doing several parallel things in a shutdown maintenance. And so, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of advancement to see how how we could, uh, you know, especially for some of the critical applications, can we, uh, you know, uh, replace the uh, uh, what do you call uh, radiography with ultrasound? Uh, I don't see this working, but um, so what? What has been done now is to uh, see how the
so so that is uh, so that is the uh, uh, you know uh, the uh, what is called as the phased array inspection of uh, the boiler tube butt welds you know in, in any power point uh, power plant the uh, boilers have you know hundreds and thousands of these tubes with a lot of butt welds now each of these butt weld uh, if they had to be inspected uh, during after installation i'm talking about this during uh, in service uh, when they take shutdown uh, doing radiography limits them to just one shift and so here this is the technology which came uh, with phased array ultrasound as you could see he could move the scanner take a, a quick uh, you know um, uh, kind of uh, inspection scan of the whole weld and within less than 5 minutes uh, the inspection has been completed and with this ultrasound there is no restriction they can work all the three shifts of the plant so so while we are talking about fundamental advances these are other challenges in the field which we need to look at you know um, um, cordon of distances limiting the number of shifts uh, and how do we uh, though x-ray probably is a great technique uh, putting limitations because if you had a 15 day shutdown and you worked only one shift uh, you you just get a total of 120 hours, uh, you know, to do this inspection. But with ultrasound, now you get close to 360 hours, and that you could cover a lot more welds in the shutdown rather than radiography. So that's just an example of how the phased array ultrasound, which is a very popular technique now, uh, has helped in this case. Uh, eddy current, again, a very popular NDE technique, uh, moving from single to array, as you can see here, has revolutionized the way we can inspect welds. We can cover large areas. Uh, it's flexible now, the probe, and all these fantastic advances have happened in the last two decades to make weld inspection, as you can see here, uh, you know, very, very uh, more uh, easy, more reliable, uh, faster, because it can cover a larger area because you have an array of uh, sensors. And of course, you can now mount it on a, uh, on a, on a robotic kind of device and do an automated inspection, okay? Uh, just like what is uh, shown here, you can do pipe welds. You can do, uh, you know, any any virtually anything you want, uh, you know, with this array sensor. So the so the whole array sensor technology is something which has revolutionized the world of uh, NDT, be it the uh, eddy, uh, ultrasound array or the eddy current arrays. Uh, the infrared thermography, which is again a very popular method, a, a more of a passive method, where we take an infrared image of. Uh, you know any object and then determine the hotspots and then decide uh, presence absence of a defect again during weld and now ir has moved into the realm of uh, in c2 weld monitoring which means it can pick up a defect as the welding is happening and just imagine the kind of benefits it can give to process improvements and uh, you know much more uh, robust structural integrity decisions uh, residual stress in welds again big big challenge uh, has continued to remain a challenge uh, for the weld uh, uh, structures. And in spite of all the efforts, we have made significant progress in ND of uh, residual stress, but still, I think, uh, way, um, uh, way behind being totally satisfactory. So right from XRD to Bachhausen noise to ultrasonic uh, synchrotron, some of them are easy to use, some of them are not, some of them are pretty much surface, subsurface methods. Uh, you know, um, lots of challenges. So residual stress, as I showed you in the uh, triangle uh, right before, continues to be still, uh, you know, haunts the ND engineers as some place where we really are still looking for a lot of uh, solutions. Um, and then, of course, uh, ultrasonic testing, if we take, uh, has moved from entirely being manual to a large amount of automation, be it in the factory or be it in the uh, you know, uh, field, you can see, you know, all kinds of automation which has happened, uh, including last large, large pipeline inspection happening using what they call as pigs, uh, pipeline inspection gauging. You can see in the bottom row, a pig and the pig being loaded into the pipe, which travels several thousands of kilometers, collecting data on the state of the pipe and, and the kind of ultrasonic magnetic flux leakage sensors, which now go on board of this are really very, very sensitive and very robust to all the uh, harsh conditions which are there within the pipe carrying either oil or gas. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, so uh, conventional ultrasound has moved uh, and moving towards phased area ultrasound, which has huge amount of advantages in terms of beam steering, in terms of you know uh, give, being at one spot, reducing the number of scans, covering the entire weld area or any other inspection which you want, and slowly 
the world is turning towards the increased use of phased area ultrasound for all kinds of inspections. Uh, the other advanced ultrasound techniques uh, are uh, something called the guided wave top uh, left hand corner uh, where you have an array of sensors uh, which can which send a guided wave through the pipe. Uh, or a tube or any axisymmetrical structure and can pick up uh, you know, uh, metal losses uh, and other defects uh, over a large range to several hundred uh, feet in uh, length. And that uh, eliminates the need for scanning, which would have been time consuming with a single sensor. So now it's like guided wave you can use for screening pipes and wherever you find a hotspot, send somebody with a phased area ultrasound to determine the actual uh, defect location, size, uh, position and so on and so forth. Mm. Air coupled ultrasound is another advanced form of ultrasound which uh, uh, basically does not use a couplant and is extremely good for materials like composites uh, and uh, you know other uh, similar uh, materials. And uh, because again, many of in many cases the composites uh, you're not allowed to use any water or uh, any other liquid for, for uh, fear of contamination. So air coupled or non contact ultrasound. Uh, is again an advanced ultrasound method to inspect uh, uh, specifically composites, I should say. Uh, permanently mounted uh, ultrasound sensors, again a great way of monitoring structural integrity. Uh, leave the sense, paste the sensor on the structure, leave it there, uh, go there with a IoT device uh, and then you know gather data. Here is an example on the extreme right top uh, on an offshore rig, uh, a set of walls and the flow assisted corrosion which could be the cost for structural integrity. They have, they have actually pasted a ultrasound sensor which gets monitored at frequencies whenever they want. Similarly, extremely high structures, um, high temperatures. Uh, you, we now have sensors which can be pasted and left there on board. Moving on from ultrasonic to electromagnetic uh, structures like heat exchangers, uh, condensers, and many other tubular structures, extremely popular method. Uh, of using eddy current and all its different forms which are listed there, conventional multi-frequency, pulse, remote field, so on, depending on material, carbon steel or inconel or admiralty brass, you know, depending on what is the liquid you are using, uh, you can use any of these advanced electronic. And now it's all fully automated today. The, in the picture, you are seeing the man holding a probe and pushing it into the heat exchanger. He has to push it to the other end and slowly pull it out. And as he pulls it out, he watches the signal on the screen. All that is uh, gone now. Uh, you have full, fully automated puller pushers, fully automated data acquisition, data processing, and all you get today is the tube sheet map, which will tell you which tubes are uh, have a uh, high amount of erosion or corrosion or damage and needs to be plugged and which ones are good to go. So that's the level of automation which has happened. Uh, we already talked a little bit about uh, um, X-ray imaging, uh, move, moving entirely from film to what we call as uh, CR or DR. Uh, in the digital detector array, we use a rigid, uh, robust uh, solid state detector, uh, while in the computer radiography, we use a imaging plate, uh, which can be used in place of the film and put it into this, take a shot, put it into the scanner, get an image, and you can reuse it for a couple of hundreds of times. So slowly doing away the film as you know involved uh, you know typical film radiography the results would take you two and a half to three hours the fastest uh, with digital um, uh, flat panel you can get it in 30 seconds flat in computer radiography you can get it in five minutes flat so any day any day uh, these are the technologies industries should be moving to of course moving from 2d to 3d uh, it's all about industrial computer tomography ct which is gaining so much popularity, especially in the world of additive manufacturing. And no doubt, because the features it can offer you are so fantastic. You can see the turbine blade on the lower right hand corner. Every single detail, just like again, what the doctor used to do with the brain scan. Uh, today, the ND engineer can do with a CT scan of a turbine blade, go to any slice, figure the dimensions, figure the porosity, figure anything which you want to figure out at, at down to a, you know, a Micron level. Uh, so we have the uh, CT machine, which you can see on the top. Uh, pretty, uh, I, I'm certainly not portable, but uh, certainly can be fitted into a lab uh, and uh, you could do uh, pretty large components also, including an engine block and so on. Okay, this is all covered. Uh, IR, we already talked about lots of lots of applications uh, just because of uh, its uh, fantastic ability to, uh, you know, uh, 
make a thermal map of the object you are scanning and give you so much information at one single glance. And uh, at least uh, it can act as a screening method where you do this and figure out, you know, be it an engine, be it a motor, be it a circuit breaker, you know, very, very quickly it gives you a glance of the heat map, helps you make a decision that there is something wrong and then you can go with, uh, you know, otherwise climbing up a, a, a kind of a distribution, a transmission tower and figuring out, you know, doing an inspection of a circuit breaker is not, not something which is, you know, very easy to do. Inside a furnace, in uh, looking at the refractory living, uh, lining in blast furnaces uh, and other furnaces, um, again, you know, IR can be a fantastic uh, uh, tool. Lots of developments, you know, again, not getting into the details, but uh, you can use microwave heating, you can use, uh, you know, uh, laser heating. We do something called sonic IR imaging where we excite the defect using an ultrasound uh, pass through the material and so on and so forth. So, so many variations of IR which can all be used now for different materials, different thicknesses and for different defects. Uh, the other big advances which have happened is the use of microwave ND. Uh, again, great uh, development uh, going beyond the eddy current frequencies of a, uh, a few megahertz. We are uh, really going into you know, hundreds of uh, uh, megahertz and into gigahertz uh, in the microwave ND, and it's a great ND technique for dielectrics such as ceramics, rubbers, polymers, and of course, uh, composites. And uh, here you can see the microwave inspection of the turbine blade made of a glass fiber composite. Uh, being tried out, you know, the upper uh, thing and great for FRP kind of things. Lots of tanks and pipes uh, which are uh, there, uh, you know, um, where the welds are there, joints are there or the integrity of this. Virtually uh, other techniques like uh, and, uh, ultrasonic or X-ray uh, can do it, but then it, it becomes very expensive when you look at the asset cost and the microwave that way comes in very handy, very effective on these kind of uh, materials. And of course, it's also very, very uh, useful on the thermal barrier coating on turbine blades and other things. Uh, going beyond that, uh, the microwave into the terahertz uh, frequency, mm, um, you know, again, you know, much higher frequencies in the into the hundreds of terahertz closing, uh, clo uh, sorry, hundreds of gigahertz coming closer to a terahertz, uh, you know, 0.1 to 1 terahertz. Fantastic uh, resolution uh, abilities of this uh, terahertz uh, wave. Again, a great technology for uh, you know dielectric materials and non-metals, which means uh, structures like aerospace structures, foams and uh, composites, uh, laminates, and all of those which are typically non-metallic in nature. Uh, big advantage being unlike X-rays, this is non-ionizing, very very safe. And of course, can be you know uh, it's also being having lots of applications in the healthcare industry, food industry, and uh, you know electronics industry also. Um, again, you know uh, it's a non-contact method. Uh, you can pick up uh, voids and other defect defects as you can see in the left-hand side uh, picture, as as small as 500 microns. Uh, so very very sensitive, uh, very fast, and uh, provides a lot of information. Uh, just a snapshot of all the things which terahertz uh, waves can do uh, you know be you know uh, in the aerospace industry pharmaceutical food uh, moisture analysis very sensitive to moisture uh, and of course the automobile industry uses it extensively for the high end cars like bmw and um, you know uh, the mercedes and others uh, where the expensive cars the paint thickness actually gets measured using terahertz because there are six layers of paint uh, and every layer has a critical thickness which has to be met. Uh, no other technology can do that measurement except terahertz or fully robotic system is available. Same thing is also used for the thermal barrier coating in uh, turbine blades uh, where uh, terahertz probably can give you down to plus minus uh, 10 microns of information on thickness. Can also be used to detect the TGO layer and the uh, potential deterioration of TBCs on turbine uh, blades and of course, goes to composites and other other areas also. Um, OK, moving on, uh, some more examples of uh, you know, um, terahertz on GFRP samples, ability to um, detect defects and so on, and cryofoam samples. Uh, so yeah, so basically uh, at the end of the day, 
uh, a very novel and advanced technique just catching up in the industry, uh, still very expensive and hence uh, limits uh, its use uh, today to still uh, R&D or the high end, as I said, automotive industries, uh, the, the big end cars and so on and so forth. But hopefully as cost comes down, we'll see uh, you know, uh, this technology becoming more popular for coatings, paints, composites, rubbers, rubber, plastic, and other similar applications. Okay, so I'm going to skip through some of these applications. Uh, and then, of course, uh, one of the other popular methods, uh, which still, again, you know, the jury is up there to see whether this is really works or not, is what it's called as the nonlinear acoustic or nonlinear ultrasound method. A lot of work has been done. Uh, you know, there are good results and there are not so good results. Uh, but people have not lost interest. And uh, this is again an excellent method to uh, look at uh, uh, damage at a precursor stage, especially fatigue damage. And uh, you know, lot, lots of work has been done, but I would say, uh, you know, acceptance by the industry is still uh, is not there because I think there's a lot more to be proven, especially in terms of repeatability and reliability for the nonlinear ultrasound technology. Uh, another similar technique called the spatially resolved acoustic spectroscopy uh, developed by uh, university in UK. Uh, you know, excellent, uh, you know, again, based on ultrasound, but uh, you can see here the fantastic uh, brain structures and orientations which you can see uh, using this uh, technique. Uh, this uh, currently has certainly found greater acceptance, especially where they wanted to see the microstructure in greater detail. Another technique which came into vogue uh, quite a, some time ago, and we at GE also did pursue this, is called the positron annihilation NDE. Again, uh, any any of these techniques, uh, if you look at nonlinear, if you look at uh, uh, you know uh, SRAS or look at positron, the, the thing is to, uh, you know, the conventional NDE was all targeted at detecting cracks after they originate and after they grow a little you know, based on the sensitivity. But obviously structural integrity challenges, uh, material state awareness, life assessment challenges posed uh, and, uh, to the NG, ND engineers, the challenge that can you detect precursors to crack formation? And that's where many of these methods came. So positron annihilation, again, a great method where, you know, I pinch a, <clears throat> a generation of positrons through sodium 22 or any of the other uh, things earlier, it used to be do, done with a linear accelerator. Uh, but uh, we have now isotopes which can do it, and the annihilation happens due to the you know presence of uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, different types of uh, defects, you know point defects which exist in the material at the time of uh, damage accumulation, and the positron getting annihilated is a direct indication of the extent of damage. So we used to measure something called the S parameter, and as you can see, you know the S parameter increases when voids. Uh, are more and you can see the curve uh, there pink and blue which clearly indicates you know damage versus non-damage uh, similarly uh, same thing when, when it was done with a continuous uh, interruption of uh, cycles uh, on, a, on a sample you can see how the s parameter was continuously uh, changing with amount of accumulated damage cold work and no cold work on the right hand side a clear indication uh, you know using positron annihilation. So all these were technology which gave some confidence uh, about the use of this technology, but still again, you know, the same, you know, same, several of these techniques in the ND world, which uh, showed enough promise to detect precursors or damage at the initial stage. I think the, the biggest challenge still uh, remains out there is the reliability and the repeatability uh, has not been proved sufficiently for industry to accept it and that's where it continues to stay in the majority of the cases as an academic or r d tool uh, damage scale and evolution again you know just a snapshot to show how different technologies can really you know uh, are used at different levels right from micro to uh, macro there are several other nd advances uh, which are not going to cover but magnetic buckhausen noise techniques something called pcrt process compensated resonance technique electromagnetic acoustic transducer, several acoustic techniques and advanced visual techniques. Uh, modeling and simulations have played a big role in all the advances in ND today. We can design some fantastic transducers, uh, you know, uh, to detect what you want to. And of course, also 
uh, do a full full uh, simulation of how the signals will look like and uh, you know what to expect. So ND modeling and simulation has been uh, quite a quite a bit. Uh, of course, in the uh, case of structural health monitoring, uh, you know these are the fundamental physical principles which have been used for ages and continue to be used, uh, and I think will be continued to be used by uh, industries. You know, be it uh, vibration, guided waves, CVMs, or you know, uh, impedance tomography and eddy currents for various technologies. So that that was a quick glimpse of uh, you know technologies and techniques which have um, you know. Come, coming, uh, uh, which have been uh, being used. Uh, there will be research going on on several to bring it so that the goal again is, you know, how early in the stage of damage can an any NDE technique pick it up reliably and give an advance warning. I mean, that's the goal for any NDE technique. Finally, uh, irrespective of what sensor you use, uh, how you place it. Uh, you know uh, how much time of data collection you do and so on. But I think the the earlier in the uh, chain you the NDE technology can detect uh, damage. I think uh, we are closer and closer to finding the solution for structural integrity. So changing gears a little uh, very quickly, we'll talk a little bit about the whole NDE 4.0 paradigm, which is comes from the industry 4.0 paradigm. So while we may do everything we want on the fundamental technique which we talked about now, the physics itself, but there are so many enablers to make uh, to do better structural integrity evaluation uh, just by increasing the speed of inspection, just by accessing inaccessible uh, areas in a in a boiler or in a aircraft engine or whatever it is, and all that gets enabled today. And of course, automation, the holy grail in everything, automation, digital transformation, and all that is coming from ND 4.0. So uh, we are basically using several of these emerging technologies, which all of you are hearing day in and day out, be it AI, AR, you know, drones, IoT, robots, uh, to, to see how it can be combined with the basic ND technique to enable better structural integrity. So the digital transformation, which again, you're seeing all around you, um, comprises of the digitization, digitalization and digital transformation. And the same is happening in the ND world. Like the rest of everybody in the ND world also is using enough of artificial intelligence to automate, uh, especially the data analytics uh, process and things like this, like the entire automation of the uh, defect detection, you know, uh, be it the casting which gets inspected through X-rays and then the algorithms which can actually pinpoint the presence of porosity uh, or whatever defect you are looking for. Um, you know, the whole automated defect recognition is, is a big paradigm. And uh, how it helps is because, uh, you know, the reliability of the human operator, uh, in, in respect of how much attention he pays, uh, is still always an issue in the ND and inspection world, and automation can help to resolve that to some extent. So there's, again, little details about the various things, you know, be it ultrasound, X-ray, infrared, CT, everywhere it has got, uh, you know, uh, got uh, its uh, footprint now uh, to help automation of the uh, inspection process, inspection data analytics, and the decision making process of presence, absence of a defect, and, you know, the characteristics of the defect also. So the drivers for automation obviously is everything which you can see is speed, quality, uh, harsh environments. You know, there, there were, uh, you know, there were situations uh, in uh, in refineries and chemical plants and other industries where uh, even if they had a 15 day shutdown, you really could not enter the, the structure just because of the uh, amount of uh, toxic gases which are around. And uh, that would prevent, uh, you know, effect, effective inspection because you would probably get the last two days uh, out of the 15 day schedule to do your inspection. And today that can be entirely overcome just by using uh, robotics and uh, drones. So just, just as an example of that. Bridges uh, are probably one of the very popular when it comes to structural integrity from ages has always been an issue uh, and uh, you know so many accidents. Uh, but what has changed uh, you know in the bridge inspection, the bridge uh, in uh, structural integrity is the fact that uh, this whole domain of robotics, which has come uh, combined with, of course, AI and ML and everything else, uh, plus the novel sensors which have come, has made uh, bridge inspections much, much 
uh, reliable. And and the challenge again, you know, with bridges are uh, these are unique uh, structures where you have part of the structure underwater, part on the ground, and part hanging in air. And so you're looking at uh, robots and uh, devices which can cover all aerial, ground, and underwater, which which is something very unique. And then so you know. Um, today, if you look at it, so we have fully autonomous systems where you use the ground robots, the underwater ROVs and the aerial robots mounted with all kinds of advanced sensors combined with AI to really give you a very, very robust uh, bridge integrity, uh, bridge structural integrity. Robotics is playing a very big role uh, in enabling better structural integrity. Um, an example here is the power plant boiler, huge uh, structure, three stories or more. Uh, with a large number of tubes and a huge amount of defects, you know, wall thinning and many other things which happens. Conventionally, you have to put it in the scaffolding. Uh, the in inspector, as you can see, will go and do a visual inspection. Then they'll send a guy with ultrasound, do measurements and do what you like. You could probably cover less than 5% of the boiler surface area in one shutdown. And that would be very, very difficult because you have to do so many inspections to really cover the entire boiler and this just to give you a typical idea uh, 210 megawatt boiler 186 kilometers of uh, pipe length and uh, 12,000 uh, you know joints belt joints so just just imagine the volume we are talking of here and so uh, you know this is how it would be done you know guy would go inside stand over hang from ropes do the ultrasound you can see this guy i mean obviously a very very inconvenient way of doing inspections uh, you know, uh, you know, hanging from the air and doing ultrasound wall thickness measurements and uh, confined spaces, all kinds of issues. And that's where all these uh, novel uh, robots have come, um, you know, uh, which today you no human entry is required. You just send the, uh, you know, um, the robot into the uh, into the boiler or any structure which you want. And uh, with the, with the all kinds of sensors, you can mount a um, what's called high definition camera, you can mount an ultrasound sensor, you can mount an eddy current sensor, and you can control everything remotely from outside the boiler, and the robot will kind of cover the entire uh, thing and come back. Uh, no human entry required, and you know, just just a fantastic piece of, uh, there are many, many videos I, I will not be able to um, uh, show in the interest of time, but uh, that's the kind of, developments which have happened in the robotic world combined with ND sensor to do a most efficient and reliable inspection covering larger areas, accessing inaccessible areas, and of course, you know, giving reliable uh, results for better decision making in terms of structural integrity. Uh, here is one more. This is, you know, inspecting a, a pipe at, I, I guess, at very um, high levels. Maybe we'll just play the video for a couple of uh, seconds so that you get an idea. Yeah, here is lowering the, you know, the robot with all the NDE sensors inside. Uh, and as you can see, there's no no human being inside, and uh, you know, uh, so it becomes much much easier to do inspections uh, with these kind of additional uh, devices and all the advances which have taken place in 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 robotics. Um,
So that was an example of how you could do, uh, you know, inspection at uh, heights uh, on pipes without building scaffolding, without building, uh, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, without having to hang from a rope and all that. What would have typically taken them uh, two to three days it can could be finished in 45 minutes. So that that just gives you an idea that with uh, that savings in time, you can cover larger areas of a plan during a shutdown maintenance which have structural integrity issues and uh, can effectively you know uh, be more reliable in your decision making process similarly the the wind turbine blades are another classic example of how uh, you know long structure at great heights very challenging when we come to nd inspection this is the plant in uh, double spit uh, here just 50 kilometers from bangalore uh, where they manufacture the uh, the g's uh, wind blades uh, you know, um, very, very big plant. And, you know, as you can see here last early this year, they manufactured the 44,000th uh, blade here from this particular plant and lot, lots of uh, challenges uh, uh, when it comes to wind blades. Again, you know, the downtime pretty, pretty much is due to blades, uh, you know, and so again, blade failures, lot in the news uh, this year and past last past year. So quality issues, obviously, on the forefront. And uh, you know, challenging inspection while it's on the ground, no issues. As you can see, the guy is moving with an ultrasound probe or an IR camera. He can scan, do the inspections. But just imagine once it's installed up in the uh, on the tower, then you need lifts like this, uh, and uh, to do the inspections. And by no means a very very easy way to do. Uh, the other option is to bring the wind blades down using a crane, and then do. And this becomes very expensive. A, B, you lose productivity. So obviously, uh, you know, uh, people have been looking at uh, better methods to do the wind blade inspections. Uh, onshore, if you say it is uh, challenging, just imagine what it would be on offshore with all the turbulence happening. And if somebody had to hang from the rope there and do a blade inspection, pretty scary and unsafe, of course. And that's where the whole uh, ND 4.0 is looking at drone based inspections for all structures be it uh, a turbine, uh, wind turbine blade or the boiler. And, uh, you know, obviously huge, huge advantages we are already seeing uh, because of less downtime, no disruption to normal operations, get enough data as much as you want, reusable data, re huge reduction in cost. And of course, the biggest thing, safety. No human being needs to climb up the tower until, uh, until you, the drones have identified uh, what the issue is. And uh, then you just go send somebody up the uh, tower uh, just to do that specific task rather than, uh, you know, uh, spending hours and days up on the tower trying to do uh, ultrasonic inspection or any other things. So maybe the last uh, one video on where the drone inspection of wind turbine blades is uh, headed. Um, here you can see the drone and uh, what what's now being trying uh, we are trying to do is to combine drones and robots in some form where you know the drones go uh, fly with the uh, uh, small robot and an ultrasonic sensor and uh, they go and land on the blade and then uh, uh, you can uh, release the probe so that it makes contact with the blade and then do an ultrasonic uh, you know uh, scanning uh, you can also, of course, they also use visual, a uh, lot of visual and infrared images to uh, capture the state of the blade and make decisions in terms of uh, extent of damage, lightning strikes, bird strikes, uh, erosion of the, uh, you know, uh, what is called leading edge of the blade and so on and so forth. So you can see here the drone landed on the on the blade and uh, uh, it will, uh, you know, set up the ultrasonic probe there and you can see a roller there. And uh, yeah, here you can see on the ground, the operator can see the ultrasonic data um, of the blade without having to climb up the tower. They can cover the entire blade in probably you know less than about 20, 25 minutes. And uh, if you really find something alarming, you could then send uh, the technicians up the tower for a repair work or bring the blade down for a blade replacement. So that's, that's uh, where the, you know, uh, drone technology is headed. Uh, second. Yeah. So, so what what could take uh, 
this together when you go up the tower today in 40 minutes, uh, we can cover all the three turbine blades. And this is the kind of images you can get from the high definition camera. And uh, you can really do a lot of analysis uh, of these images in terms of the damage, extent of damage, and uh, kind of repair or any remaining life assessment solution. Same is with the uh, IR imaging, get fantastic images of the blades and uh, really make a lot of decisions in terms of uh, defects, failures, erosion, corrosion, abnormalities and anything. And of course, uh, uh, drones are getting to be used in uh, scanning aircrafts before they are delivered to the end user in terms of making sure no dents, no cracks, no paint uh, chipping, anything else, you know, but the quality of the uh, final delivery of the plane is there. And of course, uh, uh, I, I again won't go into this, but a lot of development on nano robots, uh, which can go into the engines uh, for inspection. And again, Airbus is doing a lot of work of combining drones, crawlers, uh, sensors, uh, and uh, you know things like augmented reality to to really um, make a very comprehensive uh, decision making tool, which can enhance the. Uh, ability to uh, make decisions related to structural integrity. Uh, last but uh, not uh, last, but the second last uh, is on the uh, all the augmented and virtual reality uh, devices, which are helping to uh, really change the way inspections are being done, maintenance is being done, and uh, you know again in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, show the videos here. Uh, and last but not the least is uh, uh, the digital twin, which is the uh, you know, the new thing uh, which everybody is looking at as a means to uh, uh, help uh, do better structural integrity analysis. Uh, all know that it's a digi digital uh, replica of the physical asset and uh, the data is what connects both the worlds. And so, you know, delivers a very unique insight into, uh, you know, uh, the state of the uh, component or the structure which just not combines uh, physical models, but real operational data. And that can bring a whole new insight into, you know, the uh, what 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 is the state of the object or state of the material and what can be done. So digital twins and structural integrity, I think, uh, are kind of going to really you know, uh, get together as we go along uh, because of the benefits it brings in terms of predictive ability, you know, for uh, you know, the uh, structure uh, and uh, making it much more useful for the plant operators, for the asset owners to uh, to take get an advanced warning in terms of either stopping the plant, reducing the load on the plant uh, and also helping, you know, performance uh, uh, kind of uh, predictions and so on. So at the end of the day, it's a combination of all of these advanced sensors, be it ND, be it SHM, combine it with robotics, combining it with uh, AI, ML, and all the other enablers of ND 4.0, uh, and really doing inspection or monitoring, uh, combining it into a digital twin to get uh, outcomes of for structural integrity, which can help improve, of course, safety, availability, increase, maximize performance, and uh, improve the reliability. Uh, with that, I know I've probably gone a little over the time, so. I uh, just want to thank you once again for this opportunity and I hope uh, there was some useful content for uh, the audience in terms of what exactly is taking shape in the world of NDE, sensors, automation, robotics, drones, AI, ML, as related to inspection of assets and indirectly, of course, to structural integrity assessment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean, for a wonderful lecture. You have taken us to the complete world of NDE and SHF here. Wonderful lecture and really enjoyed it. So I'd like to ask the audience, do they have any questions? If you have, please unmute and you can ask them. Ask Sean. Okay, I had a question. If I can go ahead. Yeah, yes, Vikram, yes. Yes. So thank you. It was a wonderful overview. I learned a lot, actually. Um, I had two questions. One is this um, monitoring of damage and at the microstructural level and where a transition takes place to a, a crack, which might then lead to failure. Um, how, how important is it in an in a, in a, in a industrial situation to actually monitor microstructural damage? 
Uh, do we have enough time generally once uh, a flaw can be detected to then take appropriate remedial action or is it really necessary in situations to be able to look at damage at the, you know, the incipient level? Uh, yeah, so yes, I, I guess the the simple logic or philosophy is that we uh, would like to detect it at the earliest stage so that we have enough time uh, for ourselves to take any remedial action. A, B, uh, the, the fact that, you know, most of our assets work on scheduled maintenance, uh, you know, and so, you know, it becomes very, uh, you know, uh, difficult once you know that I have the inspection interval of or one year or two years or whatever, depending on the component, uh, you know, you you really do not have a window of opportunity between those two inspection intervals to figure out anything about the component. So okay. so it is it's a it's a uh, tricky uh, situation where we uh, you know we have always wanted to detect it at the earliest stage, uh, be it fatigue or be it creep. You know, uh, for example, in the um, in the case of aircraft engines or the gas turbines in the uh, gas uh, land based gas turbines uh, but we strongly believe that it could help us better in doing all our predictions especially helping the client to take measures to shut down much earlier uh, you know the plant before the tur turbine blade snaps and breaks and damages a whole lot of thing be it in the aircraft engine or be it on the turbine so we, we strongly uh, believed in the philosophy that uh, any early detection mechanism is good. We know that we are, you know, trying to, you know, hit the envelope when we are trying to do it at the very early stage. But the goal was to see how early can we 